if you have any general questions about sharks, feel free to head over to our website um, and the also the previous um, webinars that are on our YouTube channel. But for now, uh, Josh, why don't you just introduce yourself and uh, I'll leave the floor to you. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. All right. So as Jenny said, I am Josh Moyer. I'm a PhD candidate. That means I'm working on my doctorate at the Amherst. So I've actually prepared a little slideshow for you guys to show you some cool shark pictures and uh, some videos. So I'm going to share my screen now and let's get started, shall we? Sounds like a plan. All right. Well, right now, everybody should see this. It says, Sink Your Teeth into Shark Biology. So that's the title of the talk. And like I said, uh, I've been interested in sharks since I was, well, gosh, I guess four or five years old. And there are lots of different things you can study about sharks. Some people study the, how they swim. Some people talk about how they move around through the ocean. They talk about their behavior. They talk about their digestion. You name it, people say that's why sharks are so great. There's a lot to learn about them. I am particularly interested in their teeth, their jaws, and how they feed. Right, so this, this comes to a big idea, a big theme in my research is this big idea of how a shark, what a shark eats is part of how it interacts with its environment, right? And broadly speaking, many, many of you probably have heard this word before, but when we talk about how an organism, whether it's a shark or another fish or any other animal or plant, interacts with its, we call that its ecology. Right? So ecology is looking at how an animal interacts with its environment, with the other animals around it. So I have two pictures here on this, on this screen. One is a lemon shark. That's the guy that's looking right at the camera. And then in the bottom left-hand corner of the slide, there's a nurse shark. So these are two different species of sharks. Right? And I put a little dialogue bubble here, and the lemon shark says, I'm a lemon shark. Sometimes I'll eat crabs. Sometimes I'll eat lobsters. But what I really love to eat uh, it's fish and smaller sharks, right? So you can imagine that the lemon shark is going to interact differently with the fish and the smaller sharks around it. The nurse shark, on the other hand, says, I'll also eat small fish once in a while if I can catch them. But what I would really like is a nice crab or octopus or other treat that I could find on the seafloor. So you can imagine just because these two sharks have different diets, they're going to interact differently with the animals around them. So we would call that their trophic ecology. Whenever you hear the word trophic, you should be thinking, oh, it's like a food web. Sometimes people call it a food chain, but in reality, we know that it's a lot more complicated than just this species eats that species. It's really complicated. So sometimes we call it a food web. But whenever you hear the word trophic, you should think about how an animal eats, how it's interacting with its predators and prey. All right, so these sharks have different trophic ecologies. So sometimes people will ask me, if you're so interested in feeding, why do you pay attention just to teeth? And I say, well, first of all, I don't just pay attention to teeth, but teeth, shark teeth, are very, very important because you can learn a lot from them. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll put this picture up and you can see this is a great white shark tooth. There's a great white shark. And you can see there's a real similarity between the serrations on, a, on the side of a great white shark's tooth and the serrations on a bread knife. So I zoomed in there in that picture and I took a picture of the serrations on the bread knife so you could compare it to the serrations on a white shark tooth. And that's not a coincidence. What do we use bread knives for? Well, we use them to cut through bread, right? What are some other things you know that have serrations like that? Well, saws, right? If you go through a piece of wood or something, you're gonna take a saw blade, they have serrations too. So one of the things that you can learn by looking at a shark tooth is you can get a, a general sense of what that shark might eat. How might it be using its teeth? If it has serrations, that's a pretty good indicator that it wants to cut through something. Other times, you can look at the overall shape of the tooth, not just the serrations, but like this. This is a, on the left-hand side, this is a tiger shark tooth. 
And on the right hand side, this is a picture of a can opener, like the kind you might take with you if you went camping or if you were in the army. Right? What do we use can openers for? Well, we use them to puncture something hard and then open it up, right? Well, guess what? Tiger sharks are doing the same thing. Their teeth are great for biting through the hard shell of the paper. Love to eat sea turtles. So there's a special word for looking at how an animal, or in this case, a part of an animal, like a tooth, is shaped. We call that morphology, right? So if you're looking at the morphology, or if you're comparing the morphology of one tooth to a tooth from another species, we'd call that comparative morphology. And morphologists, people who study morphology like me, are really interested in form and function. That is, how is something shaped and how is it used? Okay, so we're going to build on that now that I've sort of given you an idea of why I'm interested in shark teeth. So we're going to build on that, but, but, but before we do, there are two things that I want you guys to all remember. The first one, is that sharks can go through thousands of teeth in a lifetime, right? We get two sets of teeth, our baby teeth and our adult teeth. That's why it's so important that we take care of the teeth we get because after that second set, after we get our adult teeth and we don't get any more, but that's not a problem for sharks. Sharks just get one generation of teeth after another, after another. So that's one thing that I want you to bear in mind. Another thing that I think is really important is that you know that sharks have skeletons made of cartilage. What the heck is cartilage? Well, cartilage is a special kind of tissue. It's not as thick or heavily mineralized or hard as bone, right? In fact, you have some cartilage in you right now. If you reach up and you touch the tip of your nose and you wiggle it back and forth, it can wiggle back and forth because it has cartilage in it. The tip of your nose doesn't have bone in it, it has cartilage, right? So shark skeletons are made of cartilage. In fact, we have a special word for fish that have skeletons made out of cartilage. They're called chondrichthys. Chondro means cartilage, and ichthys, like ichthyology, would be fish. So chondrichthys are cartilaginous fishes. And you'll see why that's important in just a minute. All right, so here's a picture. When I said sharks can go through thousands of teeth in their lifetime, Check this out. This is a picture of a jaw from a poor beagle shark. So that's like a cousin of the great white shark. And if we zoom in to that little boxed area, you can see our teeth up front. Those are the teeth that would probably bite into a fish. But behind them, you have all these replacement teeth ready to go. So when one of the functional teeth is lost, a replacement tooth comes right back up to take its place. We have a special word for that, polyphyodont. You're learning a lot of new words here, and that's great. So if anybody likes to play Scrabble, you should be well-equipped after today's talk. All right, so polyphyodont means many generations of teeth. It's just a fancy word of saying sharks won't run out of teeth. Sharks are polyphyodonts. All right, so remember that other thing that I told you about? Sharks have a skeleton made of cartilage? Well, that's really important to remember because sharks have been around in one way, shape, or form, in one species or another, for more than 400 million years. That means if you hopped in your time machine and you went back 400 million years ago, you would still see sharks in the ocean. Now, they wouldn't be the same species that you see today, but they would still be swimming around. They would be sharks. All right, but here's the problem. If sharks don't have skeletons made of bone, if they're chondrichthys and they have skeletons made out of cartilage, when those sharks die, those skeletons don't hang around very long. They get broken down, they get picked apart, they don't fossilize well. So the picture that I have here is a picture of a little bony fish from about 50 million years ago, right? And you can see individual bones in that skeleton. It's not hard to spot. But with sharks, you would have a really hard time finding a fossil that looks that pretty because their skeleton would break apart. But we know that sharks have been around for at least 400 million years. How do we know that? Well, sometimes we get really lucky and we find parts of their skeleton, but oftentimes we find teeth. Many, 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 many teeth. In fact, fossil shark teeth are some of the most commonly collected teeth in the whole world. 
Why? Because we have 500 living species of sharks right now, and many, 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 many more extinct. So that means they're no longer around, extinct species of sharks. So if you think, hey, sharks have been around for 400 million years and there have been many different species of sharks, and each one of those sharks has been turning out one tooth after another after another and losing teeth, that means there are a lot of shark teeth to be found. We just don't have much more of them, but we have lots of their teeth. So that begs an interesting question. How can biologists learn about extinct sharks and the trophic ecology, remember that phrase, we're talking about what they ate and how they interacted with the animals around them. So how do we learn about the ecology of those extinct sharks if we only have their teeth? Well, one way is through comparative anatomy, right? That basically just means you're looking at the anatomy, that is body parts, in this case teeth, and comparing it from one species to another. And if you know a lot about one species and a fossil shark tooth is very similar to the tooth of one of the species you know about today, you can make a hypothesis, right? So an educated guess about how that fossil shark might use its teeth and what it might be eating. So for yourself, I put three different pairs of teeth here on this slide. Over here, we have a modern great white shark tooth and then we have a fossil white shark tooth. In the middle we have a modern sand tiger shark tooth and right next to it we have a tooth from a relative, so not a sand tiger shark, but a fossilized relative of the sand tiger shark. Right? Down in the bottom right hand corner we have the tooth of a modern day mako and right next to it we have a fossilized tooth from an extinct species of mako shark. Probably, I would hope, you can see that there are some similarities here. So if we know what modern day white sharks like to eat, like seals, sea lions, sometimes they'll scavenge on whales or dolphins, right? Smaller sharks, fishes. We might look at that tooth and we say, hey, that fossilized tooth is very similar to the modern white shark tooth. Maybe they're using their teeth in similar ways to eat similar types of food, right? So this is a very powerful tool for people who really understand shark teeth and how they're used and how sharks use those teeth to infer, right? To look at an extinct shark and say, I have a hypothesis about what kind of food that shark would eat. So like a shark down in the middle, you can see they don't have the big serrations. They have pointy teeth. Well, let's think, what sorts of things do we use that have points like that? Well, forks. Right? Many of us use forks when we eat. And what do we do? We stick the fork into something. Well, guess what? Sand tiger sharks will use their teeth the same way. They'll stick their teeth into whatever food they're eating. So that means they're probably eating something that's fast and slippery if they need to hold on to it. And guess what? That's absolutely right. Sand tiger sharks love eating small, slippery fish. Right? So this comparative anatomy approach allows you to learn about sharks that aren't swimming around today, but were swimming around millions and millions of years ago. But this comparative anatomy is only part of the story. One of the things that I do that I think is, is really fun and that people enjoy tagging along and saying, hey, can I, can I come with you, Josh, and do this? I'll look at something called performance. That is, how do the sharks use their jaws and teeth? It's great to have a hypothesis that you can make by looking at shark teeth, but what's a way to test those hypotheses? Well, go out and see how the sharks are actually using their teeth. How are they using their jaws? What are they eating? That's one way to test a hypothesis. And that falls under the umbrella of something called functional morphology. Remember I told you about morphology and I said, oh, that's looking at the form of an animal or a part of the animal. Well, if you're looking at functional morphology, you're looking at how that form relates to how it's used. So, let me show you a video here. It's of a nurse shark, right? Pay particular attention to the shape of its mouth, right? And how it eats its food. Now, in this video, I took a little piece of fish. Swimming by, there's a little piece of fish. Sucks it right up. 
Not exactly like the Great White or Jaws, is it? Let's watch that one more time. Your shark swing by, opens its mouth a little bit, sucks the food right in. Great, wonderful. I think nurse sharks are cool and I know that Jillian does as well. Uh, she hosts Sharks for Kids and she actually has a book out about Norman the nurse shark. So nurse sharks are really wonderful species of sharks, but they don't eat anything like the next shark that I'm about to show you. So the next shark is a sand tiger shark and you've already seen one of their teeth a couple slides ago. You remember I was talking about how they use them to pierce slippery food? All right, so watch this. It's fast, so watch closely. Comes the sand tiger shark, boom! Really fast. Let's watch that again in slow motion. Whoa, look at that. Do you see how the shark not only opens its mouth, it actually throws its jaws forward? Lots of different modern sharks do that. Right? So here's a picture of a bull shark. And I always get a kick out of this picture because I show it to people and they say, that shark looks like it's losing its dentures, like its teeth are falling out of its mouth. Well, that's not an accident. No, the shark is not losing its dentures. Many modern sharks, so sharks that you could find swimming around today, like the bull shark or white sharks, mako sharks, sand tiger sharks are great examples. Many modern sharks have something called, ready? Here's a new word for you, hyostilic jaw suspension. You pronounce that hi o still ic right? What does that mean? Well, that's a fancy word for saying that the upper jaw of a shark is not attached to its brain case. I have a challenge for you. Take a minute as I'm talking and move your lower jaw around. See if you can move your lower jaw around without moving the rest of your head around. I can do it. That's what I'm doing right now as I'm talking. My lower jaw is just going up and down and up and down. Sometimes I can make funny faces and move my jaw around, but it's my lower jaw that's moving. Now try to move your upper jaw without moving the rest of your head. I would bet that you can't do it because in humans, like us, our upper jaw is actually fused. It's attached to the brain case, to our skull. So if we take this rather handsome looking fellow on the left, and let's say we had x-ray vision, we would see, oh yeah, there's a skull, there's a brain case, my brain is inside, and it's only my lower jaw that I can move around independent of my brain case. But here's our sand tiger friend on the right. If we had the same sort of x-ray vision, you'd see, yeah, the brain case is one thing. And then the upper and lower jaws are not attached to the brain case. They're not, a f they're not fused to it. They're not fixed to it. They just have some ligaments, some soft tissue that connects it and holds it there. But it's not attached. It's not fused to that brain case. So my upper jaw is attached to the brain case, but the shark's upper jaw is not. So what does that mean? Well, with jaws that can move around like that and different teeth, different size teeth, different shaped teeth, and different species of sharks, that means we see a lot of differences from one species to the next to the next regarding how sharks eat their food, right? And that can tell us a lot about how sharks might be related to each other. It might tell us a lot about it, the shark's ecologies. And it can also help us learn about sharks that no longer exist, extinct species of sharks. So there are lots of things we can learn from looking at teeth and jaws and feeding performance in sharks. Generally speaking, there are a couple takeaways that I want you guys to, to walk away with after today's talk. The first one is that there are always new questions to ask, so never stop asking questions. That's an essential skill for any scientist. Along those same lines, I would remind you that there's, there are many, many different books about sharks, books and articles, magazine articles, research articles, documentaries. I would encourage you, if this interests you, or if any part of shark biology interests you, read as much as you can. Because when you read, you can make connections. You say, hey, I remember this person was working on that, that person was working on this, I thought that was really interesting. And you can make your own questions and do your own research if that really interests you. The other thing that I would advise is to remember to look at all different kinds of specimens and species before you draw a conclusion. 
the world's a big place. There are lots of different types of animals. There are lots of different types of people, right? Don't just make a conclusion. Don't draw a conclusion based on one person or one shark, right? Look at the biodiversity. I told you that there are more than 500 living species of sharks. Imagine how many comparisons you could make. The other thing I want you to think about is all the different types of sharks and appreciate the differences you see, right? Differences are great. It makes science interesting. So with that, I'll wrap up what I'm uh, presenting here and I'll turn it over for questions. If you guys have any, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Excellent, thank you so much, Josh. That was really interesting. Um, we have some great questions coming through and um, I'll start with one that we ask everyone is, what's your favorite shark? <laughs> I think that's probably one of the hardest questions to answer. <laughs> My favorite shark is whatever shark I'm studying at the time, because I have never found a shark that when I, when I put it in front of me or when I see it in the wild, I don't learn something about it. Yeah, great question. But also, that's not an answer. <laughs> which, which is your current favorite shark? My current favorite shark, oh my gosh. Uh, you, you, just completely destroyed my ability to give a political answer there, you know. <laughs> what are you uh, studying right now? Let's well, right now it's a, it's a comparative study of blue sharks and bull sharks. So I suppose bull sharks, Those, that was the most recent species that I've seen. So we'll go with bull sharks. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so we've got some great questions coming through. Um, Theo, age six, asks a really great question. What does the shape of the megalodon tooth tell us about what it ate? Oh, that's a great question. That's a wonderful question. You mean a megalodon tooth like this? That's right. <laughs> that's a great question. So the first thing that it tells us is that you see this triangular shape, right? So what does that make you think of? It makes you think of a great white shark, or at least it makes me think of a great white shark. So we know that it's probably eating something big. It's not like a whale shark or a basking shark that doesn't really use its teeth. This shark used its teeth. The other thing that it tells us, if you look, I'm not sure if the webcam really picks it up, but if you ever see a megalodon tooth in person and run your hand over the edges, you'll feel serrations, right? Where have we seen serrations before? Well, in white sharks and a handful of other sharks, they use them to, they use the serrations to saw their teeth through something. So we know that it's not just eating something big, it's eating something that it's sawing through. So that's when you say, okay, well, what other animals existed at the time that Megalodon existed that Megalodon might be eating and have to saw through? And you very quickly realize, well, there were whales, right? Marine mammals. Yeah, so we can put that hypothesis together just by looking at the shape of the teeth and looking at characteristics on the teeth. So that was a great question. Very cool. Um, okay, fantastic. Um, we have Jacob, aged 11 in Norfolk, England, asks, um, have you yourself ever been diving with sharks? And what we, he asks, what's been the most intense shark interaction? So take of that what you will, but like what's been a really cool interaction you've had with a shark? Sure, well, let's see, an intense interaction. Uh, I have been diving with sharks. Um, and so the, that answers that part of the question, but what's the most intense? Well, I guess uh, this past summer, after I finished collecting data one day, we were out on the water uh, and I was collecting video footage of blue sharks and, and we pulled the camera rig and, and wrapped it up, but the sharks were, were still hanging around the boat. And we said, well, let's get some footage of the sharks uh, from underwater. And uh, I said, okay, so I put my wetsuit on and I hopped in and uh, we're in the open ocean. So that means you can't see the bottom of, of the ocean. And uh, perhaps I was, I was being silly, but I sort of forgot that, oh my goodness, the sharks can come up from underneath. They're not just coming in straight at you, at you, you know, in front of you. They're coming from all sides, you know. Uh, so being in the ocean, uh, the open ocean with 10 or 11 blue sharks swimming around you, coming up, bumping you, saying, hey, what are you? What are you? Uh, that was pretty intense. 
Yeah, and, and blue sharks can be quite curious as well, can't they? They come in quite close. And But uh, I've seen some great videos of blue sharks. There was one I've seen before of a blue shark coming up and almost just dooping uh, a scuba diver's mask and then swimming away. They're, uh, they're one of my favorite. I think they're very cute animals and they're very curious. It's always great to be in the water with them. Booping is not a scientific term, but it is absolutely the, the best way to describe what blue sharks will do. <laughs> exactly. Um, all right, so um, Gio asks, um, what's the biggest jaw you've ever found? The biggest jaw, well, the biggest jaw that I've, I've ever had the privilege to handle uh, was the jaw in the very beginning of the slide, the, the big, that was a great white shark jaw. Um, from a shark that was taken as bycatch, which is a technical word. It means that the shark wasn't necessarily targeted by the fishermen, but unfortunately it, was, it got caught and died anyway. Uh, so when that happens, scientists will say, well, hey, it's a shame the shark already died, but we can put it to good use. We can learn something from it. And uh, so that, that, those jaws that I was holding in the beginning in that picture was, was from a bycatch great white uh, that was about 19 and a half feet long. So those jaws were bigger than a hula hoop. Wow. Uh, wow, that's big. Um, Thomas asks, um, related, I guess, is not just what's the largest jaw, but um, of all of the living sharks, do great whites have the biggest teeth or are there other sharks with bigger teeth? Of all the living sharks, great whites have the biggest teeth. Right now, I will say this, that's a tricky question because there are different ways to define big, right? We're used to using the word big and just say, well, big, it's the opposite of small. It's like, yeah, but think of it this way. Everybody knows of the American basketball player, Shaquille O'Neal, right? He's like seven feet tall. Okay, if I walked up and I handed him this megalodon tooth, right, and you hold it against my hand, that looks like a big tooth. It's almost the size of my hand. Put it in Shaquille O'Neal's hand and that tooth looks very small, <laughs> right? So that's just a fancy way of saying, big is a relative term, but by most definitions, it's the great white shark that takes the prize of the modern sharks for big teeth. Fantastic. And well, let's go the opposite way. And what's the smallest one? So the smallest teeth would belong to a, a filter feeding species of sharks, right? So you could look at the basking shark, you could look at the whale shark. Those are the two uh, really popular filter feeding species that people usually know about. But the tricky thing is, remember, the whale shark is the biggest fish in the ocean today, right? So if you say, well, I'm gonna take a whale shark tooth and then I'm going to compare it to the length of its body, it's going to look really, really, really small, right? So if you want to find small shark teeth, let's say go to a basking shark, go to a whale shark. Uh, if you are interested in rays more than sharks, which are like the cousins, you know, the, the stingrays, or, uh, you could go to a manta ray or a mobula ray, right? They also have really tiny teeth because they're not using their teeth that much. They're using filter feeding. Cool. And speaking of whale sharks, um, Noah, age six, asked if you've ever swum with one before. Have you ever been in the water with a whale shark? Uh, not that I know of, no. unfortunately. <laughs> I think you'd uh, know if you'd been in the water with a whale shark. <laughs> yeah, and yet, you know, there have been times I've, I've been diving and people have said, hey, did you see the whatever? And I go, no, <laughs> no, I, I haven't. And it's like, well, you know, you're in the ocean. The ocean's a big place. If you're looking this way and the shark's that way. <laughs> I guess it would be harder to miss the biggest fish in the sea, though. That's right. Yes. So I have not been in the, not been in the ocean with a whale shark, unfortunately. But it's on my bucket list. Um, okay. So um, someone asked, what, because shark replace their teeth so often, when they grow back because they're sharp, does it hurt them? That's a great question. And the answer, as far as we know, is no, it doesn't hurt them. It's not like in, in babies, you know, human babies, they'll cry, they'll, they'll whine. And, and, you know, people say, what's wrong with that kid? And you say, oh, it's teething because its teeth are coming in, right? But with sharks, we don't think that's the case. 
uh, because if you actually look inside a shark mouth, they have little slits in the gum tissue where the teeth come up. So it's not like they have to break through the gum tissue to, to come up. Um, but I'm not, that being said, I'm not sure that anybody's ever actually proved whether or not there are nerves that feel pain associated with that. I know people have looked at nerves in shark mouths and, and they have nerves. They certainly can feel things with their mouth. Um, but I, I don't remember if there's ever been a study based exclusively on whether sharks feel pain as, as the teeth come up. But my hunch is they don't because I can see when I look inside a shark mouth, they have little slits where the teeth just whoop, come right up into position. Fantastic. And, and I guess that's one of the amazing things about shark research and about research in general is that there are still so many questions to answer that, you know, someone who, the person who just asked this question could be the person to find out in, in you know, 10 years time, maybe, because there's so much to find out about sharks and our oceans that these questions need someone to answer them. Oh, absolutely. One of the reasons I love doing these question and answer sessions with people around the world is because it gives me a snapshot of who I might be working with in 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Kelly asks, what is the most common shark tooth to find? You've most common shark tooth? Well, it would probably be a fossilized shark tooth just because playing the odds, odds are you're going to find fossilized shark teeth if you go shark tooth hunting, if you're walking along the beach. Uh, as far as specific species, I think it depends on where you're doing your hunting. Um, so for example, if you were hunting in say uh, the mountains of Morocco, which have turned out a lot of shark teeth, because remember millions of years ago, the world didn't look as it does now, right? There were oceans, places that are deserts now were underwater millions of years ago, right? So if you went to Morocco, you would probably find different shark teeth that uh, are similar to the, the lamniform teeth. So that's an order of sharks that includes the great white and the makos and the thresher sharks. So you could find lots of extinct lamniform teeth there. But if you said, oh, I want to go down to Florida and go hunting for shark teeth. Well, that's great. In fact, one of the best places to go hunting for shark teeth in the US is down to Florida, right? You could find lots of, uh, we would call them carcharinid teeth. So that means teeth belonging to sharks from a specific family of sharks called carcharinidae, right? And they look like this, right? So they would look very similar to the bull shark teeth. I don't know, can, can you see that? Is that? Yeah. yeah. So not, not incredibly big, but you might get lucky. You might find a megalodon tooth too. So the answer to the question, what's the most common type of shark tooth to find is, well, that depends on where you're looking. Um, great. And then we had Graham ask, uh, talking about fossil uh, teeth, um, how big or, or how comparable are their sizes, the fossil sizes to modern um, sharks' teeth? That's, that's a wonderful question. And just to show you that this, this individual, you said his name was Graham? Yeah. Yeah. So Graham is thinking just like scientists I know who a couple of years ago uh, released a paper asking exactly that same question saying like over the course of millions of years, how the sizes changed. Mm -hmm. And the answer is we had a mass extinction, a big extinction event about 65 million years ago, right? So if you look at fossilized shark teeth from before that, they tended to be really big. Yeah. And then immediately afterwards, they turned out to be really small and then they got bigger again. So, if you look at the megalodon teeth, that's, this tooth is probably about 5 million years old, which if you're talking about evolutionary history, it was like yesterday, right? Um, so this is really big because it happened a long time after that mass extinction. But if you're looking at that mass extinction like the day after it happened, you'd say, oh, wow, all the sharks must have been really tiny. Yeah. So that is, is part of why that's a tricky question to answer because it, it means you have to look at the history of life on earth. You can't just say, oh, I found this tooth and I found that tooth, ba-boom. You know. oh, so it's a complicated okay. question to answer. But in general, sharks, extinct sharks, uh, had really big teeth. Interesting. Wow. I know very little about prehistoric sharks and fossils and teeth in general, so this is 
amazing. I'm learning a lot and, and uh, I'm not the only one. There's lots of great comments coming through saying thank you so much for this. Um, Sebastian asks, where, where is the best place to find a megalodon tooth? Uh, if you're in the United States, I'd say go down to Florida, go to Maryland, go to either of the Carolinas uh, and, and look there. I mean, one of the places that I get a lot of my megalodon teeth from is from colleagues that uh, are diving in rivers in North and South Carolina and sifting through the bottom. If you say, well, uh, I don't really need a megalodon tooth, I just want a cool souvenir of a day at the beach, uh, Venice Beach in Florida is unofficially the shark tooth capital of the world, at least that's what they tell people. Um, but you can go through and you take a sieve and you, when the tide is out, you go through the patches of shells and you sift through and you can find teeth like the little carcarina teeth that I showed you. Um, if you're in Africa, you can go to Morocco. If you really want an adventure, you can, you can go to Morocco. They have great fossils there, right? There are even places in England where you find lots of shark fossils, right? So the question, where do I go to find a shark fossil is, well, go to a local museum and ask them, what did the environment look like five, 10, 15, 20 million years ago? And try to pick a spot don't go trespassing, of course, right? Make sure you, you have permission to go there. But pick a spot where you know the environment was an environment that the sharks would have been swimming in 20, 30, 40 million years ago. That's right. And we've got some great places in Europe as well. I know that Belgium, Antwerp in Belgium has some a lot of, um, a, a lot of shark teeth there. So um, There are entire books written about the shark teeth found in Antwerp. Yeah. Yeah, so it depends where you are, but I'm sure there's someone very close to where, where you're watching today. Um, okay, so uh, just to wrap this up, um, there's a question that we get asked often uh, for our guest panelists, and uh, it's quite a general question, but um, you're currently doing your PhD research. Um, why did you choose this job? And why do you, what advice do you have maybe for young kids, um, but also for older students, maybe who want to follow a career um, like like in research, um, what advice do you have for them? Do they, is there any subjects that they should follow? Are there any things that they should do um, to make to give them the best chance? Sure, that's a great question, and it's one that I asked uh, myself years ago. I had asked anybody that I could could find, uh, and I don't know how many of you know about a woman named Eugenie Clark, but she was affectionately referred to as the shark lady. Um, unfortunately, she passed away several years ago, but she had a, a, has a very strong legacy in shark research. And when I was 11 years old, I wrote to her and I asked that exact question. So I can give you her answer because she wrote back and then I can just sprinkle my own opinions on on top. Uh, she basically said, well, look, if you want to be a marine biologist, Go to college, right? Get your undergrad degree and, and study hard and make good grades as best you can. But it, you should go to a college that you think uh, has interesting people and interesting courses of study, right? Because if you're not interested, and believe me, there will be times as you are studying where you just go, oh my gosh, I can't look at another book, right? But that's okay. Just stick with it. Because if you're interested in what you're doing, it'll make it much easier to do well, right? So go someplace with people who interest you. Study hard, make good grades, especially in math and science and chemistry, which is funny because if I showed you my math skills, you'd look at me and say, what the heck are you doing here talking about science? <laughs> but do the best that you can. That's all anybody can ask, right? Do the best that you can in, in those things. But my opinion is also read and explore broadly, right? So. You know, read books, take art classes, because you never know what connection you might make, right? All right, so that's basically how do you become a marine biologist? And then you look for grad schools. If you say, hey, I love studying, I love science, I love academia, I want to stay in this, I could really do this, I'd say, and look for grad schools. And that's where you reach out to people who are doing the kind of research that you want to do. And you say, hey, can I work with you? And sometimes the answer will be, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have the money, or I'm retiring, or whatever. But then sometimes the answer is, yeah, I'd love to work with you. Come on on. Come on on. Come on in and work with me in, in our professional circle. 
And that would be great. So perseverance is the name of the game. Now, that being said, if, as I was saying that, you're sitting there going, I don't want to go to more school. <laughs> that's fine. That doesn't, that, that's fine. That, that doesn't mean that, oh, you're, you shouldn't be a marine biologist or work with sharks. There are people I know who are artists, filmmakers. Uh, they have degrees in business, right? They're photographers. There are many different ways to work with, conserve sharks and work with shark scientists. There's a whole branch out there called citizen science, right? That's going up and, and talking to citizens and saying, hey, we need, we as scientists need your help to learn about sharks. If you're a fisherman or, or you uh, scuba dive and you see sharks, tell us about it, right? So my advice is if you want to do shark science, go to school, go to college, try your best, but also keep an open mind because there's more than one way into the ocean. That's right. And even if you choose a different pathway, it's never too late to come back to it later on in, in life. You know, if you decide at some point that you really do want to do it, then you can always come back to it. Um, and also uh, for the younger children out there, just keep an open mind about the world in general. You know, go out and, and look at animals on, on, on land as well as animals in the water. You know, get your scuba diving certification. Uh, or even just go snorkeling and, and observe the world around you and, and get out there and explore because I think it's really important to keep that open mind. Absolutely. And tell your parents all about sharks and tell your friends all about sharks because telling people is also one of the biggest ways you can make an impact. All right. Well, thank you so much, Josh, for that. That was really great. Um, some fantastic information in that presentation. Really enjoyed it myself. Um, it will be posted on YouTube later on as well for anyone who missed it or wants to share it. And um, if anyone has any more questions about sharks, feel free to go and visit our website um, and our social media. Josh, do you have any social media that people can follow you on? Sure. You can find me on Twitter. I like to post a lot of the pictures and videos that I showed you. My Twitter address is at Elasmobrank, J-K-M. And Elasma Brank is just a fancy way of saying shark skates and stingrays. Um, so I know that, that uh, Sharks for Kids has my contact information. And so if you find my profile on the Sharks for Kids website, there's a link right to my Twitter handle. That's right. Uh, okay, great. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, have a lovely afternoon. Um, and we'll see you all next week for even more uh, webinars all through the week. We've got a great lineup, so join us next week. Thank you so much. My pleasure, thank you. Have a nice evening. You too, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.